Sup, you beautiful bastard. Hope you having a fantastic Wednesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing I want to talk about today is an incident around a police force that pops up in the news a lot, it feels like, and that is the Baltimore Police Department. It's a story that'll most likely result in this video getting knocked off of recommended, but I think it's important we talk about it. So there's this video that went viral over the weekend that seems to show a use of excessive force by police. I'll let you be the judge of it. We see uh, in the video a man is yelling at a Baltimore police officer. He slaps his hand away from him. The officer begins punching him and still punching him and wait and still punching and punching and still punching and then ta kind of tackle but then still punching and more punching and I'm not touching him. The punching appears to have stopped. And then the officer rests his body weight and elbow on the man's neck. So we have this video, but what did the police say initially happened? Well, according to police, on Saturday morning at around 11.45 a.m., officers in Baltimore working on a crime suppression detail related to crime in the area. Two officers ended up encountering a man that one of the officers was already familiar with. After the first encounter, officers released him and approached him again to provide him a citizen's contact sheet. But when the man was asked for his identification, he refused and the situation quickly escalated. So there's that. And then what do we hear from the man? Well, the man has now been identified identified as Deshaun McGreer. Following the incident in the video, he was reportedly taken into custody, but he was not charged with any crimes and he has since been released. That said, he did end up having to go to the hospital to treat his injuries. McGreer's attorney saying that his client suffered a fractured jaw and ribs, swelling around his eye and ringing in his ears. Also adding that he's planning on filing a lawsuit. And as far as what McGreer says happened with this incident, he said he was sitting on the steps when Officer Arthur Williams passed by in his vehicle. McGreer saying moments later, he began walking down the street when the officer now on foot told him to stop without giving him a reason. It also turns out that McGreer had a previous encounter with this same officer on June 26. And actually, a friend of McGreer posted a video that he says is of that June incident, although as of right now, there is no confirmation from the police. But what we definitely do know is that the June incident resulted in McGreer being charged with assaulting an officer, disorderly conduct, obstructing and hindering, and resisting arrest. And for that, McGreer was released from jail on June 28th and is set back to be in court on August 22nd. But people are using these two instances to say that McGreer is being unfairly targeted, and as his lawyer said, the officer has been using McGreer as a punching bag. But main point, this instance happens, the video goes viral, what happens next? That same Saturday, Interim Police Commissioner Gary Tuggle released a statement saying, I'm deeply disturbed by the video that surfaced online earlier today. The officer involved has been suspended while we investigate the totality of this incident, adding, part of our investigation will be reviewing body-worn camera footage. And in a separate statement that same day, he added, I have zero tolerance for behavior like I witnessed on the video today. Officers have a responsibility and duty to control their emotions in the most stressful of situations. And we also learned that the second officer involved was placed on administrative duties pending an investigation. And following Gary Tuggle's words, we saw somewhat of a political pile-on. Baltimore Mayor Catherine Pugh calling the video video disturbing, demanding answers and accountability, saying how they are working day and night to reestablish the trust of all citizens in the BPD. A spokeswoman for the governor is saying that Tuggle was right to take immediate steps to suspend the officer and investigate. Baltimore City Councilman Brandon Scott calling for the officer to be fired. And actually what we ended up seeing there is that the Baltimore Police Department announced that the officer had resigned. The BPD releasing a statement saying interim commissioner Tuggle has accepted his resignation. The second officer remains on administrative duties. This remains an active criminal investigation. And that's actually why we're talking about this today because yesterday, Baltimore State Attorney Marilyn Mosby announced that there was a warrant issued for Williams' arrest. And the reason for that is the grand jury has charged Williams with misconduct in office, one count of first-degree assault, and one count of second-degree assault. Mosby also adding that prosecutors reviewed and presented the grand jury with a great deal more evidence than just that video. And Police Commissioner Tuggle said he reviewed two separate police body cam videos, which he described as relatively consistent with the public video. And according to police, Williams already turned himself in and was taken to central booking for processing. And also, as far as that second officer in the video, Mosby said that the preliminary assessment is that there are no criminal charges that are appropriate. And as of right now, that's where we are. And, and I will personally say, if, if you live in Baltimore, I, I couldn't fault you for not trusting the BPD. I mean, just over the past two years on this show, we've covered scandal after scandal, specifically focused on Baltimore. And when I look at the main story with Officer Arthur Williams, I am just so thankful that in today's age, pretty much everyone has a camera so that people can be held accountable. And I respect the police officers have an extremely stressful job, and you could argue, well, that guy, he shouldn't have swatted the police officer's arm away, which people have defended McGreer's action, saying it was an instinctual response to an officer that has a history with him, trying to put hands on him. But then what followed, that, that beat down from Arthur Williams while McGreer doesn't even swing back. In my eyes, that is indefensible, and I hope that Williams is held accountable. But with that said, of course, like always, that's the story, then my opinion, and I'll pass the question off to you. What is your takeaway from this one? Whether you agree or disagree, I always love to know your opinion and your thinking behind it. And then let's talk about updates around the Philip Mewson IGN plagiarism allegation story we covered a little bit ago. Essentially, the TLDR is that Philip Mewson, for 
before IGN did a review about the game Dead Cells. And a small YouTube channel by the name of Boomstick Gaming put out a video saying, hey, you, you copied me. Here are the back-to-back -back examples. IGN ended up removing the review. They investigated it. They then fired Philip Mewson. Also, while all of this is happening, more allegations came out against Philip Mewson of plagiarizing other reviews. Philip Mewson then makes a now-deleted video that's kind of almost an apology. He says he didn't intend to plagiarize. There were a lot of circumstances. He also mentions how there were other people involved, so I, maybe kind of deflecting. He also, in that video, took aim at Kotaku, who had written that there were maybe other instances of plagiarism, essentially saying they're just kicking him while he's down, that they're just trying to get the clicks. And once again, I'm trying to just quickly summarize. It was, it was a bad apology. So bad that IGN Reviews editor Dan Stapleton wrote on Twitter, I haven't seen an apology this poorly received since Kevin Spacey. And you had IGN PC editor Tom Marks just not having any of it, tweeting, just to be abundantly clear, plagiarism isn't a mistake, it's a choice. And obviously keep in mind, I'm trying to summarize this video, but one of the key things he says in the video is you can keep looking, Kotaku, and please let me know if you find anything. And in general, the internet was like, all right, challenge accepted. And since then, many more accusations have come out. In fact, so many that IGN editor Dan Stapleton announced on Twitter, we've seen enough now, both from the thread and our own searches, that we're taking down pretty much everything he did. In fact, Kotaku posts that even his LinkedIn resume appears to be copied from a job template website. And as of right now, we haven't seen another statement from Philip Mewson. Like I said, that uh, apology video that he uploaded earlier, he's removed that from his channel. And ultimately where I land on this is I feel like Philip Mewson has made it incredibly hard for anyone to be sympathetic towards him. One, the issuing the challenge to Kotaku and thus the rest of the internet to find more plagiarism, that is amazing. It feels a little bit like a boyfriend who got caught cheating and he's having an argument with his girlfriend. He's like, yeah, if you think I'm cheating, why don't you look through this phone? Wait, no, why are you actually looking through my phone? That statement was meant to exude false confidence so that you didn't feel like you had to actually look. And in his video when he apologized for the embarrassment and saying he's not angry at Boomstick Gaming, which why would you be? Although I guess all the bad guys in Scooby-Doo, they were always kind of angry at Scooby-Doo and the gang. And since he provides no real ownership over what happened with Boomstick Gaming, where you could maybe go, okay, you know, maybe he had ridiculous time constraints. He tried to, you know, shave off corners, right? Maybe he could make it into a conversation about the unrealistic expectations in the modern workforce. Uh, but no, he just looks like an asshole. And worse yet, some would argue a thieving asshole. And actually, as of right now, if I feel sympathetic towards anyone, it's probably IGN as a whole. Because whether it's right or not, the actions of this individual have for a certain percentage tarnished the entire brand and all of the individuals that worked there. And that's even with IGN swiftly responding to the accusations, then investigating, then actually doing something about it. And this very specific situation makes me wonder if we do this most everywhere else, where an individual or two individuals from an organization make you distrust the entire organization for insert blank reason, even though it's kind of a broad reaction. But yeah, for now, that is where this story is. But from that, I want to share with you some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by SeatGeek. And SeatGeek, if you don't know, is the fantastic ticket app that takes confusion out of buying live tickets, whether it be for a comedy show, a sporting event, a concert, or whatever. They put all the tickets in one place, they give them zero to 100 scores so you know if you're getting a good deal or not. I've got the app on my phone and it's by far the easiest way to shop around for tickets and there's really no better time. You've got baseball season right now, the regular season for the NFL is about to start soon, there are a ton of concerts, whether it be Childish Gambino, Drake, Taylor Swift, whoever. And best of all, if you make the smart move like many from the nation already have, you go to SeatGeekPhil.com, you download the SeatGeek app, and make sure you enter in code Phil and you'll get $20 off your first ticket purchase. And the first bit of awesome is today we enabled memberships here on YouTube. Now I will say I've been personally resistant to the idea of enabling memberships here on YouTube since we have a pay subscription service called DeFrancoElite.com. Early content, exclusive content, live stream perks, etc. there. And so what we decided is to enable it here so people can support in that way and they get things like the custom badge, the, the, the special emotion that we're still fleshing out right now. We'll include some community updates, nothing that we're not already doing over at DeFrancoElite.com, but this, please note, this is not a replacement for DeFrancoElite.com. You get a lot more there. This is pretty much just for, for badges and emojis and, and set it and forget it support. But also a question with this piece of TIA, what other emojis would you like to see us add? Then we got the Honest trailer for Avengers Infinity War. And actually we also have every hero in Avengers Infinity War explained by the Rousseau brothers. We also had the fantastic retin link on Jimmy 
Fallon playing Will It Hummus. Then we had the guys over at Dude Perfect putting out the Brotastic Nerf Blasters Floating Island Battle. Then we got a trailer for a movie I'm really interested in, and that is Widows. And if you want to see the full versions of everything, I just shared the secret link of the day, anything at all. Links, as always, are in the description down below. And then we should talk about the really concerning estimates coming from the Centers for Disease Control. They just put out new preliminary estimates for 2017, and it appears the number of overdose deaths in the country have gone up 10%. More than 72,000 people in the United States overdosed and died. It is a record number. And it appears the reason for this increase is connected to fentanyl and other synthetic opioid overdoses. And it's also interesting because while we're seeing a 10% rise in general, it's not a 10% rise everywhere. At the state level, we've actually seen some states stay the same. Some states actually drop off, but then unfortunately there are a lot of places where it has increased by more than 20%. And some of the states with the worst numbers include North Carolina, West Virginia, Indiana, Nebraska. When we look to New Jersey, we see a 27% increase. But all of that said, this may not all be doom and gloom. An important thing to note, these numbers from the CDC are estimates. They're not final counts, but that also might mean that in some places it's actually worse as well. But also it's important to keep in mind that the CDC, they have monthly numbers. And right now it's being reported by some places like the New York Times that the numbers are beginning to level off. Additionally, we've seen a lot of funding for states to develop programs to help people. You might remember last year, the president declared the opioid epidemic a national emergency. There was a $1 billion grant program to help states deal with their issues. And that's part of the reason why some analysts believe that we're seeing drops in states like Massachusetts, Vermont, Rhode Island. Reportedly, those states have increased addiction treatment. There are also health campaigns around overdoses. And hopefully this problem, this issue can be curbed. And when it comes to instances like this, it's why over the years, my, my position on drug use has evolved. In the past, I would look at people who were addicted to drugs or had drug problems at some point as just garbage people. But over the years, I found myself more and more sympathetic to people dealing with this struggle. To be human is to be vulnerable, right? I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people think, oh, okay, that person addicted to opioids, they, they started recreationally and you know what? They, they did that with their life. But one, for the people that started recreationally, I think we've all made mistakes in our lives. Their mistake has just stayed with them. And then I think it's also important that we look at the legal prescription problem that we have in this country as well. And I think in general, we could be better off not to look at everyone as, oh, you're just a victim. There's nothing else you can do. Obviously there's personal responsibility. But if we can try and strip away layer by layer the, the stigma that is associated with addiction, I think more people could get help and hopefully more people will pursue help and hopefully even just having this conversation of how horrible this situation is, maybe that can also lead to prevention. Don't even play around with a possibility of accidentally going down a road like this. Sometimes seeing or talking about the horrible, that's the best thing to push you away. The reason I have never smoked a cigarette in my life both of my parents smoked. It looked horrible as people who were addicted. I knew it was horrible, never even gave it a chance. I am thankful I got to learn from their mistakes. I am proud of myself for never having gone down that road, but I also think it's incredibly important not to just see myself as then better than smokers or better than people that have other addictions because I'm a bad mistake or two away from having been them. Or at least that's how I personally see the situation these days. But with that said, I do wanna pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts about opioids? Is it something that you've dealt with in your life? Someone that you know around you? Any kind of peeks into your world and your experiences, I always appreciate. Then in infuriating news, we look to Pennsylvania. And the reason for that is yesterday, a Pennsylvania grand jury released a 1,356 page report detailing abuse by over 300 Catholic clergymen against over 1,000 children within the state. And this grand jury heard from dozens of witnesses. They reviewed more than half a million pages of internal documents. They investigated six of the eight dioceses in Pennsylvania, those representing about 1.7 million Catholics. And these abuses span 70 years. And as far as those two dioceses that weren't investigated, they were actually passed over because they've already been the subject of three past grand jury, all of which, by the way, were scathing of the church's conduct. But as far as this most recent report, the grand jury did want to stress that while they can confirm just over 1,000 victims, there are likely thousands more, many of whom never came forward with their story and because the church instigated a massive cover-up which led to many documents being lost or destroyed. And they also unfortunately found that as a consequence of the cover-up, almost every instance of abuse was found to be too old to be prosecuted. And prosecutors found that in nearly every every case the statute of limitations had run out. Also, it was found that one third of the priests involved have since died. That said, many of the priests who are still alive are retired, put on leave by the church or removed from the clergy already. And then finally, a small number of the priests that we are talking about have already been charged of their past crimes. However, as a result of this grand jury investigation, prosecutors have managed to charge two men and one has already pled guilty. And in addition to sexually abusing children, the report found that there was widespread cover up of facts. And among the half a million internal documents reviewed by the jury were thousands of pages by Pennsylvania bishops 
transcripts to Vatican officials detailing the abuses. And while they told Vatican officials of the abuse, they failed to tell law enforcement as well. And after failing to tell law enforcement of the sexual abuse of children by clergymen, they would then send offending clergy to treatment facilities, which laundered the priests and permitted hundreds of known offenders to return to the ministry. And in internal church secret archives, they reportedly dismissed these abuses as horseplay, as wrestling, as just inappropriate conduct. And this whole conspiracy of silence wasn't just in the church, it was with people outside of the church, but connected to it. Even when an abuse was reported to police or prosecutors, they sometimes failed to act on it simply out of deference to church officials. And as of right now, the Vatican has declined to comment on this report, but we have seen from Cardinal Daniel DiNardo from the United States. The report of the Pennsylvania Grand Jury again illustrates the pain of those who have been victims of the crime of sexual abuse by individual members of our clergy and by those who shielded abusers and so facilitated an evil that continued for years or even decades. As a body of bishops, we are shamed by and sorry for the sins and omissions by Catholic priests and Catholic bishops. And the Cardinal also defended the church, pointing out that the Grand Jury's report spanned 70 years and nearly all of the abuses in it took place before 2002. And while that is the case, there's also a legal battle happening in the now. While the statute of limitations has passed for most of these cases, the grand jury has made clear. We are going to name their names and describe what they did, both the sex offenders and those who concealed them. Essentially saying, while we cannot legally prosecute you because the church protected you, for everyone involved, the third that are no longer alive, the two thirds that are still alive, we're gonna let people know who you are and what you did. And so many still living priests are fighting for their names to be redacted from the document. And so at this time, the release report has some names redacted. And so next month, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court will decide if the priests named who are beyond the statute of limitations have the right for their names to be redacted. But even then, many prominent figures still in the church are named. And in fact, one of the most prominent is Cardinal Donald Wuerl. He leads the Washington Archdiocese and he was formerly Pittsburgh's bishop. And even though it's reported that he was initially adamant about priests engaged in sexual abuses having no place in the church, he eventually stopped complaining and just followed church orders to promote and transfer priests, eventually engaging in routine practices to notify the church when abuses happened, but not authorities. But he himself denies the allegations that he was complicit in a cover-up. And additionally, we have another legal battle specifically about the statute of limitation. Many victims advocates calling for the removal of statute of limitations when it comes to the sexual abuse of children. And specifically in Pennsylvania, child victims have until they're 30 to pursue civil suits and until 50 for criminal charges. And this is actually a recommendation from the grand jury itself. They wrote, grand jurors are just regular people who are randomly selected for service. We don't get paid much, the hours are bad, and the work can be heartbreaking. What makes it worthwhile is knowing we can do some kind of justice. We spent 24 months dredging up the most depraved behavior only to find the laws protect most of its perpetrators and leave its victims victims with nothing. We say laws that do that need to change. We want future victims to know they will always have the force of the criminal law behind them no matter how long they live. And we want future child predators to know they should always be looking over their shoulder no matter how long they live. And looking into this further, in the United States, roughly only 14 states have no statutes of limitations when it comes to sex crimes against minors. And I say roughly because in certain states it depends on if it's classified as rape or sexual assault or something else. And I will say I personally agree with the grand jury here. I think it is absolutely insane that a sexual predator, a sex offender, someone who abused children can just be scot-free because they wrote out the clock. They do a range of horrible things to children who are in emotional and mental vulnerable states. And when you look at the victims of sex crimes, so incredibly, unfortunately, so many of these victims think that they are somehow responsible. And so they feel shame and they stay quiet and then you just add religion to the mix where you have this person that is supposed to be closer to God, this person that is using that position as the ultimate manipulation. And as far as the redaction of the names, I want every one of these people to be named. I don't care if they are alive or dead, the world should know them as the monsters they were. And in fact, these monsters who abuse these children or protected the other monsters, they make me hope that God is real. And not just God, God, I'm talking Old Testament God, because these people that perpetrated and shielded these other monsters, they deserve something biblical. Because as of now, it appears the laws of man have failed us. But that is where the story is right now. I do want to send thanks to any and all who have, have dedicated their time, some dedicating their entire lives to finding people and holding them accountable. And that's where I'm gonna end this one. And that's where we're going to end today's show. And of course, remember, the Philip DeFranco Show is also meant to be a conversation. So whether it be the last story, the first one, anything in between, let me know what you're thinking in those comments down below. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo face, and I'll see you tomorrow.